We good? All right, if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, Psalm chapter 10. Let's see. Let me Psalm chapter 10. And if your Bible is like mine, it will be on page 705. Let's, uh, let's stand and honor the reading of the Word of God. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth, per doth persecute the poor. Let him be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his conscience uh, of pride of his continent, excuse me, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above, above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in, advers in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud, and under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages, and the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to, to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of all names, God. Lord, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, if there be one among us that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, we pray they come to know you before it's everlasting too late, Lord. Lord, we lift up those that are watching by way of social media, God. We lift up those that, that don't have a, a, a Bible-believing church nearby to go to, Lord. Lord, we, we pray for, for people to plant churches in those areas, Lord. Lord, we pray for, for those people to be willing to drive a little further just to get to a, a church where they can rub shoulders with some Bible believers, God. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. But most of all, we thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all be seated. Today we're going to be talking about confronting the spirit of Antichrist. Not confronting the Antichrist, but confronting the spirit of Antichrist. In order to confront the spirit of Antichrist, we need to understand just how deceptive the spirit of Antichrist is. In Psalm chapter 10, we're going to be drawing some parallels between the wicked that you see that you see uh, addressed here in verse 2. It says, the wicked in his pride to persecute the poor. We're going to be drawing parallels between the wicked and the Antichrist, which King David is describing. It is important for us as Christians to understand a couple of things. King David wrote this in a different dispensation to a different group of people at a different time. It is still for our good today to to read and reflect on this and, and to understand exactly what's being talked about. King David is actually talking about future events here. This, this one comes down to prophecy. This one comes down to Bible doctrine. This psalm isn't just a psalm that's going to be sung. This psalm is a plea to God to do what God does and defeat the, the enemies that are standing against us. It's important for Christians to know that we've got to stand firm in our faith. Satan wants to blind who he can blind. He wants to trick who he can trick. He wants to shake who he can shake. And he wants to destroy who he can destroy. It behooves us to look ahead at the enemy's plan. If you're in here today, you're living in a time where we have access to the Word of God and we have access to the enemy's plan. We can look in the back of the book and we can see what's going to happen with the enemy. We, we have something that's far better than what David had. Dave, a lot of these things that David would write, 
He had no idea why the Holy Spirit was putting on him to write these things. I mean, a, a man that's, that's given prophecy, unless he's seen it himself, uh, there, there are some examples of them seeing it themselves, like John the Revelator. He had a chance to see for himself. Paul had a chance to see for himself. David didn't have that opportunity. So he's writing it for a future time. It behooves us to get ahead, to get ahead in the book. As I said, the Azariah had already, uh, had already finished the reading through the Bible, it will behoove us as adults to have enough childlike faith to want to read what our Father in Heaven has written to us. And, and not only read it, that kid memorizes Scripture. So, I mean, to read it and hide it in our heart so that we can know what comes next. What behooves us more than being able to anticipate um, the next move, it behooves us to know the outcome of the war before we even step foot on the battlefield. Uh, Brittany and I, we've got a, we've got a show that, that we like to watch sometimes. It's uh, called Outlander. And it's about a, a woman that travels back in time. It's obviously not going to happen, right? But she travels back in time. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody if you want to see it. Um, but she, going back in time, she has the vantage point of knowing what's going to happen. So when battles come up and when they're fighting battles, she knows who the winner is going to be, and she has that little bit of a little bit of confidence when her husband goes onto the battlefield. She understands if he's going to come off or what's the odds of him coming out of, out of the battlefield. And we need to get inside of this book that tells the ending, the ending from the beginning. We need to get inside of it. We need to understand that the battle's been won and we need to fight our, our battles from a position of victory from the very beginning, knowing the outcome. We can do that. We have an advantage over a man like King David who was so powerful and has so much authority. But this Antichrist is deceptive in nature. One of the ways the Antichrist likes to deceive people is he likes to use Christians to do it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a Christian say, well, I'm not going to read the book of Revelations because it's scary. But brother, you need to grow up. You need to read that book. You need to, you need to get in that book and, and read it to find out what happens. You've got the enemy's battle plan in front of you. You need to read it so you know how to fight the way the enemy's going to fight. Oh, I can't, I can't understand the book of Revelation. It's full of symbols and all boo-hoo. You can't understand anything you don't read. You're never going to understand it if you don't read it. Oh, there's types and symbols. and Oh, I, you know, people say this and people say that. I, I don't even know what to believe in. You know, maybe you should try reading it and believing what it says. Let's just start there. That's your baseline. Believe what the book says. Don't worry about what somebody's told you is in there. Don't worry about where somebody's trying to scare you away from reading that book. Don't, don't, I, I've heard people say, oh, that book's not for children. Be doggone if it's not. I hope and pray to God my children will read it without, without being afraid to read God's Word. This is God's holy Word. It is definitely for them. But people would do that. They would say, oh, don't, don't read it because uh, it'll, it's so confusing. Imagine how much more confused you are not having read it when the things start happening around you. Verses 10, uh, or chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, we're going to go through them here. It says, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Verse 1 begins here with a cry from David to the Lord. And it's easy for us to feel alone when we're going through spiritual warfare. Even King David, a man after God's own heart, felt alone when he was going through spiritual warfare. But we ought to be able to follow King David's example and call out to the Lord, especially when we feel alone. But as I said last week, don't wait until you're alone. Don't wait until you feel overwhelmed. Learn to call out to God in good times so you'll be able to call out to God when times get bad. King David knew to call out in good times, and he did. We see example after example after example of him doing so. And when times get rough, even when he loses a child, he knows that he can still call out to God. Verse 2 goes on here. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of their heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God, but is not in all his thought. But God is not in all his thoughts. 
I'm going to rephrase that. I'm gonna, well, I'm not going to rephrase I'm going to read it to you again. God is not in all his thoughts. And now I'm going to kind of paraphrase that one for you there. He's not thinking about God at all. Um, God is not, at all, is not in all his thoughts. It doesn't mean that God's not in every individual thought. This means he's not thinking about God. This is talking about the Antichrist not considering God in anything that he does. Verse 2 through, verse two through 4, they begin by speaking of the arrogance and the pride of the wicked. The wicked has no fear of God because of his pride and because of his arrogance. The wicked does not concern himself with the things of God because arrogance leads the wicked to believe that he's his own God. This is, this is just a, a matter of fact. Before a person gets saved, that person is sitting on the throne. They're their own God before they get saved. When a person gets saved, they get up off of the throne and they allow Jesus Christ to take His proper place, His proper seat. Jesus Christ is now on the throne. This is, this is uh, absolutely um, opposite of what the Antichrist is doing. The Antichrist knows good and well that it's Jesus' throne and he chooses to sit on it anyway and to make you think that it's his throne. This wicked, this wicked thing that David is talking about, this wicked man, is a mirror of the prideful nature of the Antichrist itself who exalts himself above God and demands to be worshipped. Another parallel that we can draw between the wicked and the Antichrist because they're both fools. To think that they can prevail against God. You're talking about prevailing against the God that, that created the sun. You're talking about prevailing against the God that tells the ocean to stop at the beach. You're talking about prevailing against the God that was able to part the Red Sea for Moses. You're talking about prevailing against the God who sent the plagues. You're talking about prevailing against the God who told Moses to hit a rock and water would come from it. You're talking about prevailing against that God that holds all power and all authority and any authority in the world is loaned out from Him. You're talking about an Antichrist that is so prideful and so arrogant that he knows good and well that what authority he does have will be on loan from God. And yet he still, still thinks he's better than the one that, that gives him the power. He's a fool. But yes, the Antichrist will reign. Praise God it won't be in my lifetime. Praise God if you're, if you're a born-again believer, it won't be in yours. You'll be out of here. You'll be called out with the church. But the Antichrist will reign nonetheless. It will be a short-lived reign because he will be kicked off the throne by Jesus Christ. He'll be trespassing on that throne. Jesus Christ will kick him off of it those that fear the Lord have nothing else to fear, including the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1-4, through 4, the Word of God says this, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind nor be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by the means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition." who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now keep in mind, you don't have to worry because Jesus Christ, he's already, he's already defeated that joker. It happened back on Calvary. He's coming back now just to remind that joker that he's been defeated. I want you to understand this. We're going to look at verses 5 through 11. We're going to look at some more, de more deception that the Antichrist uses, but then we're going to get into how, how Jesus has, has already won this battle for us. Verse 5 says, His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the, of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth and waits secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth and waits to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, 
God hath forgotten. He hideth his faith, his face. He will never see it. Verse 9, it talks about for us about the wickedness, about how the wicked lieth in wait. Verse 8, if you back up, it says that he sitteth in the lurking places. I want you to understand something about the Antichrist. I want you to understand something about Satan. Is He is a murderer, he is a liar, and he is a deceiver. There are two categories that you can lump any person or any activity that you can think of into. It is either for Christ or it's against Christ. And if it's against Christ, it's Antichrist. So we're not just talking about this son of perdition that will, that will come in the, um, in the tribulation period. We're not just talking about that. We're talking about the spirit of Antichrist. And I'm going to tell you what, the spirit of that Antichrist has affected even born-again believers. There's born-again believers today that have more in common with that spirit than they do the spirit of God. We're going to talk about them. This is not just the Antichrist, but it's types and shadows of the same Antichrist. Matthew 12 and 30 says, now this is Jesus talking, He that is not with me is against me. Understand this, if it's not for Christ, it's against Christ. If it's not with Christ, it's anti-Christ. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Guess what that means? We're all called to lead folks to Christ. If you're a born-again believer, you have a call and you have marching orders. You have something to do. Every single one of us is to be an evangelist, just like the woman at the well. We're all called to do that. If we don't do that, look what Jesus says, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You're either, you're either leading folks to Christ or you're leading them away. I want you to think about that. Think about, are you trying as a believer to lead folks to the one that you believe in? Is your faith strong enough to share with other people? If your faith isn't strong enough to share, you better, get the, you better check on that thing. You better, you better make sure that you actually have faith in the right thing. Because if your faith is only as strong as the source of that faith. When we place our, you can place your faith in anything. People tell you, oh, oh, brother, you just got to have faith and X, Y, and Z will happen. Uh, oh, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Well, you got to have faith, man. Oh, oh I, I can't handle it. You got to have faith. Faith in what? You got to have faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and Him buried and Him resurrected and Him, ro or him rose again according to Scriptures. You've got to have faith in that. That's the only thing worth having faith for in, in the entire universe is that right there, that one thing. But there are believers today that do not keep their flesh in submission. They don't, they're not submitted to, to God. They believe, but hey, I'm not going to do what that book says. I'm not even going to read that book. I'm going to make an excuse so I don't read that book. That way I don't have to know what it says. That way I don't have to do what it says because I don't want to do it because I don't want to submit. Let me tell you what, there's way more freedom in submitting to God than there is in not submitting to God. I like to tell people, it's like, it's like a, a dog. I wish Zoe was here for this. It's like, it's like a, a well-trained dog. You get a, you get a brand new puppy. Anybody got a puppy in here? Okay, you get, a, you get a brand new puppy, and when that puppy comes in the house for the first time, you know, he's, he's messing up stuff, he's chewing on stuff, he's pooping and peeing and all that garbage. You get that puppy to come in, and you got to watch that joker 24-7, or you're going to be cleaning up poop 24-7. It just says what it is. He's going to eat socks, he's going to do whatever it takes to, to have fun. He'll chew everything up. You get, that, you get that dog house broke, and guess what? You can have a little more freedom. You can, that dog can be out and wander around. It can, it, can, it can go outside and it can come back in. Now you get that dog well trained like Zoe is. You get it to where that dog comes and stays when you tell it to stay. It drops what you tell it to drop. Guess what? You, when you first get that dog and you want to take that dog for a walk, you, you got to put that joker on a leash and you got to you got to walk with it, and that dog at the beginning is going to be pulling you along and jerking you around and running between your legs, and you're going to have to keep swapping the dang on uh, leash, and it's, it's frustrating. And if you're like me, you just want to punt the dog one time and see if that calms it down. But sometimes they like it, I think. Some, sometimes I think they do like that. And they'll, they'll come right back for another one. I'm, I'm going to tell you now. You know how to tell uh, if, uh, that your dog likes you more than your spouse does? Lock them in the trunk. See which one's happy to see you when you open it up. 
<clears throat> but you know, a, a dog that went on that leash is pulling all over the place. Now, when it's well trained, it's going to walk by your side. When a dog's well trained, you can unhook that leash, and you can let that dog run around, and you can <coughs> click your tongue and it'll come right over there. Come here, boy. Come right to you and stay. That dog is submitted to its master. When you submit to God, you actually have more freedom. God, God will let you get out there and actually do something for Him, but until you're submitted to God, man, He's going to have to keep you on a tight leash because I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to pull. You're going to run around. You're going to, try to, you're going to try to trip up. And you're not going to trip up God. You're going to trip up yourself. That's what's going to happen is you're going to trip up you. And maybe you might not just trip up you, but you might trip up somebody else in the process. But there are believers who are so unsubmitted to God, they, they, they say that they're saved, and, and they very well may be. They're clean on the inside. Even a baby Christian is clean on the inside, but outwardly they're just as filthy as a used diaper. The spirit of Antichrist wants to deceive the believer into using their liberty as a Christian as an excuse to sin. And when I say the liberty of, of, um, as a Christian, I want you to understand it plain as day. I've said it a bunch of times lately. There's absolutely nothing a Christian cannot do that anybody else can do. Absolutely nothing. You can do it all, but there is a price to be paid. They'll pay theirs in the future. You'll pay yours now. They'll, they'll work on credit you're working on cash. Payments due now. Before you take that drink, before you do that drug or commit any other type of fleshly sin, you need to consider that it isn't, it isn't your soul as a believer that Satan's after anymore. It's your peace. It's your witness. It's your testimony. It's your reputation. It's your joy. By attacking a believer in these areas, even though you can't lose your salvation, Satan may be able to prevent somebody else to come into Christ by messing up your testimony or messing up your witness or taking your joy. Why do I want to come to a guy when this guy's miserable over here? Well, he's miserable because he's doing stupid stuff and God's allowing him to be miserable to chastise him back into a right relationship. What? I mean, if you don't understand why some Christians live lives that are just pure tea garbage and why some people that are, that are lost seem to never have anything go wrong, you need to understand this is why. When you're out of God's will and you're His child, He's got nothing for you. Nothing for you but chastisement. And He's good to an unbeliever because God doesn't want you to come to Him because you're tired of things being bad. God wants you to come to Him because He's worth coming to to begin with. He's not going to punish you into submission. He's going to allow you the freedom to submit at, at, on your own without being coaxed into it. Now Satan, on the other hand, Satan will allow any good thing or any, to happen to, to someone that's lost and any bad thing to happen to a Christian just so he can tear them down a little bit. There, Those of you, though, that want to justify sinful action by saying, well, you know, I got it under control, preacher. You know, I'm pretty good at this. I got it. The only thing you got that's under control is you. You're under control of the spirit of Antichrist. When you look at sin and it doesn't disgust you, you're under control. You're being controlled by that spirit. This is a... I, 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 and I love him to death. I, I've got to say that I love him to death because of what I'm going to compare him to here. Uh, but I, I absolutely love Trump, man. He's the best president that's ever ever been. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, that's that that Joker. He presidents like no other, and and I, I hope to see him come in 2024 sooner. I'll take him sooner if I can get him there. But when Trump said, when he was running for president, when he said to the to the people, I mean, people laughed at this. He said, "I'm going to build a wall on the southern border. I'm going to make Mexico pay for it." Y'all remember that? People laughed. There was memes everywhere. And then he come in office and he put a few tariffs out there. And guess what? Mexico paid for that wall. Those people that laughed over that did not understand economics. Those people that laugh and say, oh, preacher, you have, you don't know, I got it under control. You don't understand sin economics. That's what you don't understand. You do not have it under control. The wall, there's going to be a wall built 
It's not going to keep you out, but you're going, to be on the, you're going to be on the good side of that wall, building a wall for somebody else to not get in. That's what's going to happen with, for, for you Christians that think you got it under control. People are going to look at you, and Satan's going to look and laugh as you're building the wall. He's not even having to finance it. He's letting the folks on the other side finance it. That's sin economics. That's exactly how it works. Now, the difference in the wall that Trump built and this type of sin wall here is the wall that Trump built was designed to keep people out and make them only come in through the right way. The wall that we build with our sin when we're doing this, that wall is a wall designed to keep good people out. We need to, we need to understand that we are... I'm going to tell you what, some folks, you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ and you're going to stand there and you're going to have to hang your head in shame when you realize how much of, of that wall of sin that you've built and kept people out and how few people you've brought in. That's going to be a sad day. Where the judgment seat of Christ, you know, I, I long to see it because that's something only believers are going to see, only saved people are going to get there. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm afraid of that day. I'm afraid that when that day comes that I'm going to be embarrassed, that there's going to be people walking around and they're going to have every crown in the world to throw down, and, I, and I'm just going to have very, very little to throw down to them. And I'm going to tell you what, if you ain't got something to throw down, if you're standing there with empty pockets and empty hands and nothing to throw down at the feet of Jesus, that's going to be embarrassing for eternity. When God records in His Word the bad things that people done, like committing adultery and murder and, and the... the incest, all the just filthy stuff that happens in this book right here, when he records it, he records it for eternity. Not everybody's going to read this book, but every single believer, every born-again believer is going to sit there and witness people have nothing to show for to Christ, nothing to give back to Him. That's gonna, it's just going to be embarrassing. Like People say, I got in by the skin of my teeth. Man, what an... What an embarrassment. What, what, a, what laziness is that? Well, that's, that's lack of work ethic. That's lack of Christian etiquette. That's, that's lack of everything. I mean, you're a miserable person if you get in and don't have anything to lay at the feet of Jesus. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt, man. It's going to hurt for eternity. Everywhere you go, they're going to look at you and be like, oh, that guy right there, he didn't have anything to throw at the feet of Jesus. Hey, well, he's glad to be here, right? Yeah, party it down, man. Good times, right? Imagine how much better it could be if your buddy was here with you, if you'd have led your buddy to Christ. Oh, but he's in hell because you wouldn't do anything to lead him. Imagine looking around. Oh, mom and daddy's not here? Unfortunate. This guy led his mom and dad to Christ over here, but you could have done that. But It was too, too fun, right? Building that wall. Satan, through the spirit of Antichrist, can and will use the wicked works of Christians to snare others into a life of sin instead of a life of submission to God. The spirit of Antichrist is something that Christians ought to flee because the level of deceit of the wicked is just beyond our comprehension. And if we stick around, there is a likelihood that we get caught up in the snare and that's why it just it doesn't edify when a, when a preacher will stand in front of the congregation and glory in the good old days when he was sinning and, and when he's sinning up a storm. I, I, I can't stand to hear that. How many young people do we have in here tonight? We'll see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, eleven, something like that. We've got eleven children in here right now. If I were standing up here and going through a checklist of the bad things that I've done in my life, and there's a lot of them. I mean, if I was going through and telling you every little thing that I've done, and glory, and oh yeah, I remember doing such and such, I'd be the biggest idiot in the world. There's 11 children in here right now, and kids, it doesn't matter what I did. You don't need to do it if it doesn't edify Christ. You need to focus on edifying God because not everybody is going to get the same opportunity that I got to get saved later on in life. If you're in here today and you're a child and you're born again right now, you better thank your lucky stars and pray to God that He keeps you from some of the sin that, that some of the older folks got into in here. You better thank God if He'll keep you out of it. Don't ever drink. 
Don't ever smoke. Don't ever do any type of drug. Don't ever do any kind of thing. Don't, don't ever even think. Don't, don't think about having boyfriends or girlfriends. Don't even think about that. Wait, pray right now. Start praying for your future husband. Start praying for your future wife right now. And as a, as a group of kids in this church, start praying for each other's future husband. There's a likelihood that some of you might actually wind up married to each other one day, and you need to be praying for each other often. You need to do that. But don't... I can't stand it when I see those preachers glory and, and oh, how bad it used to be. Or... Um, I used to do this, or smoke this, or drink this, or... Well, you, I mean, you're still drinking stupid water. They make smart water to stupid water too. Because if you're out there thinking that you're going to talk about how much fun the sin was and expect these kids not to want to do it, you, I mean, you're a special kind of stupid if you're out there doing that. And God forbid any man get in the pulpit and brag on his sin. And people, and because people are going to laugh. Pe people are going to sit out there and they're going to, oh, I remember that, I remember that bunch of idiots. Both sides. Both sides of that. You can not glory in sin and glorify God at the same time. It is not going to happen. When you're glory in sin, you have more in common with that spirit of Antichrist than you do the spirit of a holy God. Matthew 24 and 24, the Word of God says this, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonder, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. If your preacher is preaching messages that make light of sin, your preacher has more in common with the Antichrist than he does a holy, a, a, a holy God. He has more in common with that than he does Jesus Christ. The Antichrist embodies the spirit of rebellion against God. That's what he does. He displays prideful arrogance. He deploys deceitful tactics to mislead and snare people. If these kids hear me talking about something I did, they're going to think they can do it and it not affect them because it didn't affect me. That's what's going to happen right there when we glory in that sin. We talk about the good old days, all the parties we had. The whole time, Satan was laughing at us in that condition. As parents and grandparents and aunts, uncles, we ought to want better for this generation. Let's, let's move on to verses 12 through 15. We're going to be talking about the resistance against the Antichrist. Here, here we're going to be looking at, at King David's plea for God to intervene against this wicked, against the Antichrist. We can rest assured that God hears the cry of His people. He sees them in their affliction. And that's you in here right now. God sees you in your affliction. And He will bring deliverance from the, this reign of the Antichrist. Specifically here for David, but God will bring deliverance for any man, deliverance from sin for any man that will call out for, to God for that deliverance. Psalms, let's look at verses 12 through 15. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thy hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou, till thou find none. We can find hope and deliverance from the Antichrist by trusting in God's power and seeking His intervention in our lives. We can do that because our God is a covenant-keeping God. As Christians, we have a whole different vantage point uh, of knowing that God has signed His covenant that He is going to keep with the blood of His only begotten Son. Now, we need, we need to, re to really think about just how powerful that is. The God of creation, who could have snapped it or willed it into the place that He wanted it to be to begin with, wanted it done so securely that He would give the blood of His Son. You know, there, there's some folks in here um, that may have been adopted before 
or, or may have adopted someone or things like that. I, I want, particularly, I want you all to pay attention right here. I know people that they are adopted, uh, sometimes you, you struggle with that. But I want to tell you this right here. What God's done by sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins, His blood is the, what signed the covenant that keeps us. Now, by Jewish law, if somebody were... And this is the significance of adoption for us. By Jewish law, if someone was adopted, they could never be disowned. But a natural child could be disowned. Because you, you can't help if a child comes up and they, and they, and they turn out bad. But if, you, if a child's born, you can see, hey, this is a good child, and you decide to adopt that child, you can in no way, shape, or form get rid of that child or, or write that child out of your will. That is your child. That is heir to your throne. If you've got other kids, it's just as much an heir as, as the rest of them. Now, you need to understand that. Because when God makes a deal, including adopting us into His family, it's permanent. It can't be undone. We have the, the security and the confidence to know that we're adopted into the family of God. We have nothing to worry about. If you're in, if you're in here, you're watching, and, and you're adopted, I want you to understand uh, how pure and how precious and how good that that, that is, that, that contract that your parents entered into with you to, to keep you forever. They give you a new name, just like in here. You got their last name. When we're adopted into God's family, we get a new name. God no longer looks at us as our sinful selves, and He looks at us as He's looking at His only begotten Son. We're washed in His blood. We literally become blood family with God. We become flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone. The only way we're going to be removed from the family of God is if the hand of God will be amputated because we're, we're His body. We're not just in His hand. We are His hand. Now let's look at verses 16 through 18. We're going to look at the triumph of Christ over the Antichrist. Verse 16, the Word of God says this, The Lord is King forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of His land. Lord, Thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause Thine ear to hear to judge the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of earth may no more oppress. Now, King David had the utmost confidence in God. He knew that God could utterly destroy the wicked and drive them out of His land. And as Christians, we need to have the same confidence. We need to place our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. We're doing so because we believe that the sacrifice that He made gave the final death blow to Satan. What Jesus did on the cross was the final death blow. Now I understand that Satan is, as a roaring lion, walking around seeking whom he may devour. Yes, he's out. Yes, he's still fighting battles. He's already dead though. Considered dead. He's already defeated. Satan is nothing more than a glorified chicken with his head cut off, running around, doing what he can before he falls over. And his time is coming. It's marked in the book. It's coming. He's just, he's just raising a fuss right now. He's flapping his gums right now, and he's, he's kicking up dirt right now because he knows he's dead and done. We have the vantage point as Christians to know that. David prayed it, and it comes true. And because David prayed it and it comes true and God's a covenant-keeping God, we don't have to deal with that old rascal. God's not the author of confusion and He's not the author of surprises. God does not want His people to be confused or to be taken by surprise either. Outside of taking our free will from us, outside of that, God has done everything possible to save us from spending an eternity in hell where we'll trespass forever. He's prepared a way where there was no way. He's given His Son as the sacrifice that would take our place. His Son has paid for our sin with His death according to the Scriptures. He was buried and on the third day He rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. King David had confidence that God would judge the wicked, and we can have confidence that our sin debt has been settled by the blood of Christ. There is no evil, including the Antichrist, that will stand against God and prevail. And there's no sinner 
that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse. We can have confidence in two things. We have confidence in, in, in these two things, that, that nothing, no evil can stand against God and that the blood of Christ can pay any sinner's debt. Having that confidence is absolutely detrimental if we're going to be able to confront the spirit of Antichrist. Having that confidence uh, in God, that God is a, is a promise-keeping God, also lets us fully trust His Word. When we fully trust His Word, we can take heed the warnings of the deceitful tactics that Satan deploys against us. As we wrap up today, I want to remind us that the spirit of Antichrist seeks to deceive and lead people from truth. However, as followers of Christ, we have assurance of victory. Isn't it nice to go into battle knowing you're going to win? Knowing you're on the right side of the battle? It's my prayer we'll stand firm in our faith, resist the influence of the Antichrist, resist sin, and continually proclaim the hope of the Gospel. Let us find our refuge and our salvation in Jesus Christ who offers forgiveness and redemption and eternal life to all that will believe in Him. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name of all names, God. Lord, we just pray for all those that are, that are afflicted by that spirit of Antichrist, God. Lord, we, we, we know the battle's won, Lord. I pray that, that as we fight that spiritual warfare, Lord, we fight from, fight from knowing that You've already done what it takes to defeat the enemy, God. He's defeated already. There's coming a time when He'll sit on the throne. Thank God we won't have to see it, Lord. Thank God we'll be too busy praising and worshiping You at that time, Lord. Lord, but I do pray if there be one that doesn't know You as Lord and Savior, they'd come to know You before it's everlasting too late, too late just by trusting and believing the Gospel of Your Son. Trusting that Your Son died for their sins according to the Scripture, was dead and buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, God that is settled forever, and that they can have confidence in that God. Lord, we just we thank You for all those that will believe on Your name, Lord. Lord, we long to see You, Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. If y'all got business to do with the Lord, y'all go ahead. The altar is open.